I'm Johanna Nusset. I'm Senior Vice President for Strategic Planning here, and I head up our work on global food security. Um, we're really pleased to have you here. We're pleased to have a number of special guests, and we're pleased to have a chance to talk with you about a new report that we've uh, put out just in the past couple of days. It's looking at the role of GM technology in food security with a particular focus on East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. So I want to say a few words about the report and about um, sort of our process, but first I want to recognize a couple of individuals and uh, particular bits of information. First thing I, I have to say is that I want to point you to Jim Dutton, who's way in the back, who's never ever recognized or noticed, but Jim has headed up our publications team for almost 20 years, and he's read every publication we put out, and he almost um, dropped to the floor when I told him we have a very special guest who's coming from Uganda. Can we please get this report done in two weeks? And um, so here it is. So Jim, thank you. I know that you never, you never get any airtime, but we just really appreciate all that you do because our publications are such an important part of what we do at CSIS to share ideas and research. So thank you. Um, yes. So I, I want to just give you a little bit of background about this project, and then the, the agenda for today is that Kristen Wedding, who's the primary author on the report, uh, is going to walk through our findings and observations from our work. Jennifer Cook is going to follow up. Um, Jennifer leads our Africa program, and she's going to give a bit of a political forecast of adoption in terms of where GM products are with each of these countries and what some of the dynamics are within the region. And then um, for the bulk of our discussion, we're really, really honored to have Dr. Tushima Wewe from uh, Uganda. He's a banana specialist and um, is going to talk about Uganda's particular path uh, on GM technology and research and communication, which is a very, it's just a really interesting story and we're just so happy that you could be here. And he's gonna be complimented by Dr. John McMurdy, who heads up USAID's work in this area. Um, USAID has been supporting uh, regulatory work, supporting research, supporting scientific capacity on biotechnology for quite some time. And John spearheads that within USAID now, but he's also complimented with a lot of people from other agencies. The Department of State has been very engaged on this uh, set of activities in this uh, issue area. USDA is, of course, very engaged. And we've got all the research uh, universities throughout the US who also serve as partners, as well as the private sector in the US. So it's just a very dynamic set of partnerships, and we're really delighted to be able to talk about it today. Um, to give you some background on how we came to this particular set of countries and set of issues, um, we actually are part of a set of projects that's funded by the Templeton, John Templeton Foundation. Um, Patrick Mitten is with us from the foundation in the back, and so he's kind of stewarding these 14 research efforts, and Carl Prey is also with us, who's doing another one. Um, and really, the question the foundation put out was sort of a big picture, how can science change lives question, which is, can GM technology help feed the world? And from that, we said, well, we've been doing a lot of work on research and technology, scientific partnerships. We've also, we had done uh, a baseline research piece on the GM debate in Kenya, South Africa, and, Malaw and Zambia. Um, we did that, and it was published in 2010, and we took that on because as food security was starting to become much more of an issue and more of a um, focus area with the U.S., we felt that it was going to be very quick that U.S. congressmen and, and policymakers would turn to GM technology as an option. And we wanted to understand what is the lay of the land, what does public opinion really look like, and sort of what's the scientific um, debate and discussion and research look like in key countries. Uh, we come to this question in as neutral a way, I hope, as possible. We've tried to really look at our three countries over the past 18 months. We've uh, done research trips. We've done um, many, many dozen interviews with scientists, with um, journalists, with policymakers, with smallholder farmers in, in rural communities to say, what, what, is, what does this technology look like for you? What is, where is the science? Where are all of the products? Uh, and when might they come out? And who might adopt them? And what might that look like? And the results are really contained in this report where we try to, try to really neutrally assess it, does this technology have a role, and is it likely to be picked up by smallholder farmers? And we did focus on food crops. 
And I think um, it is, it sounds like a very niche topic. Uh, it sounds like a very narrow focus, but what we discovered as we got into it is, is actually quite large because it touches on every aspect of agricultural development from research to science capacity to extension to seed systems to finance and credit. Um, and ultimately, all of those systems need to work for any kind of new technology to take hold. As you all know, you know, less than a third of, of land in Sub-Saharan Africa is planted to hybrid crops. So the idea that you need to invest in all of the different systems to make any kind of crop or Im improved crop, improved technology crop, is a very important one that we, we wanted to try to emphasize. But when I, 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 I kind of asked myself throughout the course of all these discussions and all these meetings and all these tr trips, why are we looking at this? Is this really even relevant? Because there is so much to do. There's so much to do on agriculture in, in every country. And, uh, and I think we all came away, as Jennifer and Kristen and Richard and others of us um, spoke with people, there are sort of three big picture issues that we felt made it really relevant for us to be looking at this technology. One is that this is sort of the forefront of, of ag. This isn't actually the, the cutting edge forefront of ag technology. That's nanotechnology. But this is one of the important parts of science. And scientists in every country want to be at the cutting edge of science. And, it's, and, and they want to have access to be doing work in areas that are going to make a difference. So that's one important reason to look at it. A second reason is that these are very long lead times. To stand up a regulatory system to get products um, honed for a particular environment or climate takes up to 10 to 15 years. So a country can't just say, oh my gosh, we had a massive drought this year. We really need this new thing. Um, it's going to take time. So that long lead time means it's important to be looking at it uh, today. And the third, I think, probably most overwhelming uh, reason why we felt that this is an important issue was that th there is a type of tool that GM technology can bring that other conventional breeding can't bring. And I, and I think all of us, as we looked at the situation, felt that um, the message that GM technology should be for increased productivity or for all kinds of different things is, is a tough sell because you can raise productivity in a lot of different ways. But there are pests, there are diseases, there are climate issues and drought conditions that, that really can't be tackled with conventional breeding. And for that reason in particular, we felt like it was really worth looking at this particular set of questions and really spending some time analyzing it. So with that, I want to ask Kristen to give an overview of the, the project and findings and observation, and um, then we'll go from there. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Johanna, and I'm delighted to see you all here today. I also want to start out by thanking a couple of people, um, Anna Applefield and our food security work, Richard Downey from our Africa program, and Farhad Tahir from Africa program, um, really contributed greatly to the project, um, both conducting field research and also with writing the report. This was really a very large collaborative effort. Um, uh, so I, as Johanna said, I'm just going to run through a couple of the key findings um, and then Jennifer will jump into what this means. I think one of the biggest takeaways is, you know, looking at the vast food security challenges in these countries is that um, really one of the essential backgrounds is, er, backbones is investing in ag uh, delivery systems. You know, regardless of, of if the countries adopt GMOs, there are still a number of basic technologies that need to be adopted by smallholder farmers in, in, in order for any technology to really be uh, live up to its full potential. We, we noticed um, you know, that the extension systems were very weak and the seed industry uh, had a lot of deficiencies as well. So some of those barriers would need to be overcome sort of regardless of if a country will end up moving forward with GMOs. Um, and see, in assessing the debate between the three countries, we definitely noticed that it took place within the local context, but was strongly influenced both with domestic governments, foreign governments, philanthropic groups, and NGO efforts. So much of the debate that was taking place at the local level um, mirrored a lot of the debate at the global level, but also you could see how the domestic political structures really shaped it. Um, the the message that came across most clearly is, as Joanna mentioned, um, the, the talking about GM crops as a solution to potential problems 
really was a way to talk about the broader national food security debate at sort of a larger level that people could understand. So I think that's how the public becomes more involved in some of the GM aspects. Finally, I think one of the big pushing points is that political will is really going to be making the big difference on countries' choices whether to move forward with these technologies or not. The domestic political structures are, are really shaping how the regulatory system is set up and how scientific re research is conducted, and that will have sort of the long-term effects on commercialization and adaptation. As Johanna mentioned, um, one of the things we focused on was regulatory capacity. Um, a lot of investment has been done in these countries. Probably Kenya's the, been involved the longest um, and has a pretty deep bureaucracy set up and a pretty um, sophisticated regulatory system. Uh, Uganda is just in the final stages of passing its biosafety laws and then um, Tanzania is still sort of developing it and probably is the most strict of the three countries. Um, we also looked at scientific capacity in each of the three countries. And in thinking about this, we wanted to get a sense. We spoke with the scientists in all of the, the countries and really found that they're deeply committed to these issues and very have been involved for a very long time and are driven by solving the food security issues in their countries. And this really highlights the need to develop crops that, per, that are pertinent to local issues and that address those problems. But most importantly, that this work is being done and that the scientists can be such great communicators to the broader public and the region um, on what types of technologies they're working on that can improve their country's food security situation. Um, one of the recommendations that came out of this report was that uh, they, they can take a really big lead both in communicating with the public but also the importance of training journalists and rewarding them for uh, good scientific communication. The, the focus of the study really in, in the end was to look at the potential impact of GM studies, uh, GM crops on smallholder farmers. And in talking with a lot of the smallholders in the country, we, we realized that this is sort of a largely ignored population when it turns to what their opinions are on it. Many of the farmers we spoke to um, had maybe heard of GM, had heard that it might make you infertile. I mean, they just had heard a few sound bites of it. Um, but quite honestly, it's a product that's not available. And if it was, they probably wouldn't have access to it. So in the end, it was a very abstract technology to them. Um, it became, after speaking, spending the day in a, with a group in Kenya and talking about their priorities, the bottom line was sort of like, well, we'll use them if the government says they're safe and we can access them. but. <coughs> you know, I'd really like some solar light so I can harvest later in the evening or a plow. So, I, you know, I think there's a lot of things that need to be tackled along this path. Um, but the bottom line really is that farmers need good products and need access to them. Finally, uh, we looked at these three countries as part of their regional dynamics um, and really have come away with the, the feeling that national policies are really going to strongly impact what happens in the region. Um, as if one of these countries moves forward to, towards commercialization, and I think we're, as we're looking at it, it looks like Uganda might head out first, it's likely that the other countries will try to keep up. I mean, they're very inter interconnected. I think Jennifer will talk a little bit more about this, but um, it's going to be hard to sort of keep it in the bottle when neighboring countries see neighboring farmers see that their farmers have access to these technologies, um, it's likely to spur on sort of that effect. One of the other big concerns uh, that we came across is that there is really a, a real tangible fear toward that commercialization of these crops is going to have negative trade impacts. Um, and we commissioned a study by John Komen and David Wafula that largely found this to be untrue <laughs> in the sense that a lot of the crops that are being developed right now for food security crops are largely traded at the regional level and not necessarily exports to Europe. So there needs to be a focus on how to communicate that to farmers and really how to consider um, what crops they're, they're developing. Just to touch briefly on the high level points of the far forecast for adoption, um, one of the biggest things is that 
ultimately consumer and farmer demand is really going to drive is is really going to drive the need for development of these crops but right now there needs to be almost someone to push push those crops out so what that's going to probably be the government and the private sector and without without this pull from local farmers it it's hard to know how the government's going to prioritize that in a lot of other competing political um, problems that it's facing uh, without hearing a vocal call for, for these crops. Either way, uh, adoption is going to end up being sort of a, a longer process, and it usually comes with fits and starts as opposition increases and decreases. And as I mentioned, it'll likely spread through the region. Um, Finally, I think just some sort of top line highlights on the on the adoption is that Kenya really has sort of led the way on developing a regulatory system and, and uh, scientific capacity, but it really lacks sort of a clear champion within the government. Um, just recently, uh, well, I guess maybe last November, the they have a regulatory system up and running, but then they decided to ban GM imports and GM crops based on the advice of the health minister, who isn't actually part of their regulatory system. So in effect, they have a biosafety system, but didn't necessarily use it to regulate, uh, regulate GMOs. Um, so there really will, given the democratic nature of the country, there really needs to be clear political champions within the country. Tanzania, we found, um, had really a strong, robust scientific community who uh, was starting to feel a little frustrated with the work that they are doing on GM, um, and it's a, it's a little bit of an uphill battle. There's much more public antipathy towards, towards the technology and um, more distrust of the private sector. So I think in that sense, um, it's a different public opinion battle to overcome. And, otherwise, and they're also recipients of a lot of agricultural development dollars right now. So I think that the Tanzanian government's also facing a lot of pressures to um, adopt some of these higher level technologies. Finally, um, in Uganda, we see that it seems that there's been a quick, steady, incremental approach towards both their regulatory system and their, uh, the science to go along with it. So it's sort of tracked together. And they, the government has been able to communicate a message that's uniformly positive. Um, and I think this also goes to the political structure of Uganda that a lot of talking to people, the message was sort of that everyone's reading from the same script. Um, they all had a clear vision of GMOs being a tool to improve food security. Um, but just recently, as they're nearing the passage of their biosafety bill, we're starting to see an increase in opposition. So it'll be interesting to see how, how that plays out. And then I just um, included a couple additional resources that we've published, as I mentioned, the Trade and Tribulations paper. And then we have a forthcoming paper by Judy Chambers from IFPRI with an in-depth look at the uh, regulatory systems. So thank you. I'll turn it over to Jennifer now to do an in-depth look. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Kristen and, and Johanna, and to you all for being here. I'm going to keep it fairly short because I think there's a fair amount of overlap between the presentations, and we want to get to our, our star turn and our, our guest today. Um, so I thought I'd just say a little bit about some of the dilemmas and challenges um, that we found as these countries are moving forward on exploring GM crop technologies as a means to boost uh, the productivity of smallholder farmers, which was really our focus in this. The things that have slowed the process uh, and some of the things in my mind that uh, will eventually drive the process forward. The first issue, and as, as Kristen said, is that there is, is really very little sign of a demand pull um, from the end user, which is the smallholder farmer. Obviously, smallholder farmer, it's not a monolithic group. It's very hard to say, well, the farmers say this or, or that, but that actually doesn't stop a lot of people for, from speaking for the farmer. So I think there's no, no one opinion on the matter, but one does get the impression that um, as of now, the, the idea of GM is fairly abstract for the average um, rural farmer. Some of the non-governmental groups we talked to really spoke about the difficulty of explaining the technology in terms that a, that a rural farmer um, can understand. I have trouble with the concept myself at times. Um, 
one group that took us and introduced us to a group of farmers um, told us just please don't mention GM. It's just still tainted and it's it's controversial. And this was this was a group that was actually fairly uh, fairly uh, a proponent of the technology. Um, opponents of the technology told us with no doubt in their mind that that farmers are fearful that this will squeeze out traditional varieties. Uh, that they are very uh, wedded to their local local varieties. They don't want to lose those, um, and they're they're very fearful of uh, becoming entirely reliant on large corporate seed companies, um, unscrupulous uh, Western commercial interests. Proponents, on the other hand, told us that um, if, if farmers see a solution uh, that minimizes risks from pests and disease, uh, that lowers the need for costly inputs. <coughs> And that increases productivity, uh, they'll they'll probably very quickly overcome any skepticism. So I think one of the big challenges is I'm sorry I'm losing my voice. One of the big challenges is actually trying to gauge the opinion of smallholder farmers. Um, a lot depends on how the technology is explained to them, um, how the questions are framed, and frankly, who's interpreting the results in the end. So you actually get a very polarized view of, of uh, depending on, on who's doing the talking and the interpreting of what, what's, what small farmers uh, that abstract question would be. Thank you so much. One thing that, though, that did seem clear is that, <coughs> as Johanna and Kristen both said, is that GM technologies are not really a priority for the smallholder farmer even if the issues that they're intended uh, to address are. Um, a second dilemma, uh, in the absence of this strong demand pull from the smallholder and the end user, the great burden of pushing the process in research and development, in public communication, in legislative and regulatory frameworks, um, in dissemination and training, in commercialization and so forth, in regional harmonization, all falls on the public sector and to some extent on the scientific community as well. But the big qu question then becomes whether the government leadership uh, can generate and sustain the political will and momentum on GM to see it through these various processes, which, are, which, are, which require a good deal of heft, a good deal of outreach across the government to the public. And these are governments that have, are strapped with many other priorities within agriculture itself, but then on a much broader range of things. And we saw Kenya, which had a surge on, on GM and a lot of excitement in the legislature, it had Rilo Dinga and Ruto behind it, um, kind of then entered into a, uh, an election year and kind of, you know, you see that kind of uh, collapse after a while. So the, these, are co these are countries that are, are, are facing many priorities and, and, not a, and GM, Frankly, in the overall scheme of things, though it may be important for some and it may be seen as a big opportunity, is not the big political priority. Uh, particularly when there are varying degrees of public resistance and, 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 and that came up in Tanzania, uh, and an uncertain take up, uptake by the eventual uh, user. So what does help sus drive a sustained effort? First, and I think, um, again, it's been mentioned, is an empowered, articulate scientific community that has the tools um, to communicate with policymakers and to communi communicate um, with, with the broader public. In Tanzania, a lot of the scientists there told us they, they were frustrated, they wanted to be at that cutting edge, but they acknowledged we're not actually very good communicators and we don't, we don't really, it, it's, we, we don't have a whole lot of experience in, in explaining complex scientific issues and issues of risk and how do you measure risk and how do you b balance risk um, to the public or to policymakers. So that was an acknowledgement there. Um, in, in Uganda, uh, by contrast, there actually has been a very strong effort to have this kind of consistent ongoing dialogue between the public, between farmers, policymakers, and the scientific community, where, where the kind of issues that come up from, from the public citizens, you know, does it make me infertile, um, does it, uh, you know, all those kind of things that oftentimes get laughed off and, and, and dismissed as, as foolish, are taken seriously and answered in kind of a serious, um, serious uh, civil way. Um, so building kind of a trust and, and res mutual respect on that. Champions within government, as I said, um, 
it can be a powerful driver, but it's not necessarily reliable, as we saw in the Kenyan case. Champions, if they're, if they're big and influential, they probably have many things on their mind and their attention can turn. Um, so in that, in that way, you need kind of a bureaucracy and a regulatory, uh, institutional uh, regulatory framework that is kind of working on the same page, is working towards outcomes rather than simply process, that there's been a consultative process not only with the public and, and the scientific community, but within government so that people are talking on the same page and there's some consensus on that. In Tanzania, we, we were told, you know, there are, uh, even within ministries, there's a debate between the minister and the deputy, between one ministry and the other, uh, between one regulator and the other. So there's not a lot of consensus there and there's a lot of turf and, and authority, uh, lines of authority that are not always clear. <clears throat> I'm really sorry about my voice. I don't know what's happened here. Um, so I'll try to keep it short. Uh, another, another thing that may, will drive it forward is kind of the go and see missions that we've seen. And that has been an inspiration, I think, to scientists, to farmers, to legislators, and to policymakers as they're trying to, to decide. And, and actually seeing something that's concrete, going to South Africa and talking to farmers there going to Burkina Faso and talking to the policymakers and the farmers about how that process happened um, has been uh, extremely important. Uh, and I think you know, that's, that's something, um, getting the media involved in that as well, I think is extremely important. Um, a third dilemma is that as, uh, as these processes, and I think Christian, you mentioned it, as they come to fruition and the issue becomes less abstract, you're likely to see more resistance grow, and you've seen this in South Africa, where there's a big, big, uh, you know, uh, very elaborate scientific uh, infrastructure, but there's still a lot of resistance, and the kind of debates that here that go on here in Washington and so forth. Um, a couple of things, uh, kind of going forward, though. That, I mean, I've given you some of the dilemmas of this. First, I think. There is likely to be a breakthrough. I think you know Uganda is a very likely candidate for getting something on the market. I think they projected, uh, or to the commercialization stage, um, 2015, 2016, perhaps. And I think once once you begin to see these pockets of places that have crossed that barrier, there will remain kind of the very difficult challenge of disseminating it to farmers, get the uptake, and so forth. But I think that brings it from the realm of the abstract into the concrete, and you get a very powerful demonstration effect that way. I think new markets, so much has been kind of dictated and the perceptions driven by what happens in Europe and European markets. There are new markets opening up in the rest of the world, in China, India, where other GM producers, and I think that will kind of, um, as Africa turns eastward perhaps, that may uh, lower some of the the perceptions of risk and um, uh, <coughs> around that. I'm going to really stop talking any moment. Finally, the regional dynamics. Again, if one of these countries moves towards GM, right now at the regional level, there's not a lot of discussion about how policies will be harmonized. You, we, the East African com uh, community doesn't really have this as an issue within its headquarters. That was suggested. Um, a, a lot of this, though, I think will depend on whether a Uganda or a Kenya uh, moves forward with the technology will likely draw along uh, the region as well. There may be issues on that. I think Tanzania, um, uh, Tanzania is still very much, one gets the sense, but, uh, operating on the, on the precautionary principle. People talk about something of a two-track East Africa community uh, with Kenya, Uganda, um, and Rwanda kind of uh, kind of on the more, uh, moving ahead more quickly on integration, and Burundi and Tanzania kind of uh, struggling along. Um, but I think, <coughs> I think ultimately uh, it may take some time, but that regional dynamic will push the technologies forward across the region. Just one last point on, on, on U.S. engagement. The U.S. does not want to be in a position of really pushing this technology. I think it can add fuel to some of the debates that are happening within the country that are running their course. There's, in those countries that have taken it up like Uganda, the, you might, the U.S. can be focused and present and talking. In others, I think it could be very counterproductive. And there are so many other issues um, to be addressed to, to, 
to, to increase agricultural productivity and to help set the stage for the eventual uptake of GMOs where the U.S. can be focusing that mire it, that get it less mired in those controversies. Again, I, I'll stop there <laughs> and uh, turn to our next speaker. I'm looking forward to the discussion. And uh, thanks again, Joanna, for having me. Okay, well, let me just um, mention one other person who's my nice husband, Chris, here, who pointed out to me that for this project I was away one out of 12 work days over the past year, leaving him stranded with our two young sons. So he was very kind and patient to do that. Um, we're going to make sure to leave ample time for Q&A at the end, uh, but I want to, before we really turn to that, to actually get sort of some stage setting comments from John. And then Dr. Tush has um, a really wonderful and quite detailed presentation to really talk through where Uganda is. So I think we'll save that for when John finishes so we can launch into a very serious set of uh, questions and answers. And you can speak from there or from the podium, whichever you'd like. Um, actually, I will just stay here okay. if that's okay. Yep. This, this guy's on. You guys hear me? Yo, that's on. Um, okay, well, well, first, thanks uh, CSIS for, for the invitation. Uh, nice for me to be here in front of all of you, and, and thanks for, for Tush for making the, the stopover on your way back to, uh, back to Uganda. It's, it's great to, to see you here in this setting versus our, our normal setting. Um, I, I figured I'd talk a little bit about our, our rationale um, for USAID on investing in, in biotechnology, and, and I think it hits on a lot of the points that, uh, that Jennifer just finished with, um, in that there's a lot of need out there. There's certainly um, more need than we, as just one one donor, can possibly fill, and 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 there's obviously a finite amount of resources. But I think it's it's the motivation on we really limit our investments in biotechnology to those those products, those approaches that that really have a high reward. That, that there's a need. Uh, it's a challenge that we haven't been able to solve through an alternative method, and one where we can bring some, some specific advantages through our um, long history of exposure to, to this technology. So we've supported um, biotech, and I'll, I'll use biotech in this context just to mean transgenics, uh, for about 20 years now at USAID, starting with some, some very early work by Michigan State University uh, in places like South Africa, uh, Egypt, and, and a few other countries. So we have, we have quite, a, quite a history of, of doing this, and our approach has always been to um, look for countries who, who have come and expressed a, a need and an interest to us. I think there, there's, uh, there's this perception a lot that we're, we're forcing a lot of these, uh, these technologies, these R&D projects, uh, this policy engagement on countries, when in fact we're actually responding to a lot of requests from countries who, who are interested. Um, this is evidence in, in the places where we work. We're very active in places like Kenya, like Uganda, like um, Malawi, where there's the government's very interested. They have problems they want to solve, and they've come to us to, to try and help uh, look for some alternative solutions, and, and indicative of why we don't work certain places where there's not as much of an interest, places like Zambia, places like Cambodia. So we really limit ourselves to where there is that, that need and that interest from the government. Um, our investment in, in biotech, it's about maybe uh, between one and two percent uh, of the Feed the Future initiative. Um, probably most people are familiar with uh, the uh, agricultural initiative at USAID. So it is very indicative that it's that we're only f using it to focus on sort of these big challenges, and there's a lot of other activities going on out there. It's not necessarily how it's always uh, represented in, in the media, that, that USAID and Feed the Future is, is all biotech. It's really actually quite a small um, but important part of our portfolio. And we're, of course, only one of a handful of donors in this space. Um, pretty much us, the Gates Foundation, DFID a bit, Rockefeller a bit, Howard Buffett a bit, CETA a bit. That's pretty much the list right there. So there's really not a lot of players, and you know there's a very finite amount of things you can do. So it really affects our um, ability to, to make good choices on, on where we work. Um, so just a, a couple of comments. On the R&D side, um, we, we try and look for investments and opportunities where either the private sector hasn't had a willingness to engage because there's not a market, or we, we look to really kind of buy down some of that risk, focus on these high reward, um, high potential technologies. So uh, that, that can cover the gamut, the, the gamut of things that are 
you know, further upstream, for example, we support a, a number of uh, new technologies using RNAi interference uh, as an approach to address several diseases. It's, it's much more upstream research, but it's that real high reward type projects that uh, we can address things like aflatoxin, address things like stem rust, where there have been minimal, if any, successes in, in crop breeding um, for specific strains of stem rust and specifically for aflatoxin. Um, we, we, we look at a lot more that are um, kind of more medium to, to downstream type efforts. So um, you've probably heard a, a good bit in the news about the uh, insect resistant eggplant technology in India. This is, I don't know if you have seen that in the news, but um, actually the way that's presented in the news a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of times is that it's a, a wholly Monsanto private sector led project that's, you know, that's being forced upon the, the, the Indian populace and it's not going to be an affordable solution. Uh, unfortunately, the, the part that gets completely lost in that discussion is that there's a huge public sector side of that, um, taking that uh, insect resistant trait, putting it in open pollinated varieties of eggplant, making it available exactly the same way as any other variety of eggplant is. So it's uh, just a bit of a, a mischaracterization. But we, we look for opportunities like that, um, where it's, there hasn't been a, a solution um, through an alternative technology to deal with um, some of the insecticide use in eggplant, so we look at a, at a biotech approach. Um, so maybe I'll skip ahead. In addition to our, our R&D type investments, I think it's, and we all know in this room that it's important to have um, a regulatory system in order to actually get some benefit from these investments. You could obviously spend, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars on technology development and it will never get out the door. If you don't have a system that is um, somewhat grounded in science and, and somewhat um, available and and uh, can be met by the public sector. I think that's one of the, the, the things that we see a lot of times is that the only one who can meet some of the, the barriers that have been set forth by these more restrictive regulatory structures is they can't, can't be met by the, their own institutions. So that's something we try and encourage um, governments to be, be cognizant of, that to, to at least when they're developing the regulations to consider their own, their own R&D institutions who are often the ones who might have the only technology in the pipeline in that country. So they're basically working at cross purposes by restricting um, access to that. So I guess we've hit on a lot of important points in the discussion so far. I think that the underlying motivation um, for supporting this at, at all is, is really that um, make biotech more, more tangible. We keep hearing that it's, it's, uh, it's either the greatest thing in the world or it's the worst thing in the world. But when it comes down to it, it's very hypothetical in a lot of places. You, can, you have people flying in and arguing one position, arguing another position, but there's, there's nothing to argue about. It's just an idea rather than an actual product. And I think there's nowhere that that's more evident than in Tanzania right now. You have you know, a lot of money going in there from, from both sides, and there's nothing in the ground for anyone to look at. There's nothing to argue for other than the idea of biotechnology. So in a climate where you know, the, the, the regulatory system isn't necessarily encouraging for the private sector to, to bring something in there, you know, the public sector needs to engage to see where there's some opportunities, where can we actually just get some R&D started so people can understand what it is, um, whether they want to go forward with it or, or not go forward with it, at least bring it to a more fungible level. And I think that's one of the, the important roles of, of the public sector uh, in this space. Um, I think, uh, let me jump ahead here, because uh, we've hit a lot of the things. I, I think um, maybe switching just quickly on the actual report, I think it, it hits pretty clearly and pretty, uh, pretty accurately on, on the issues in a lot of these countries, at least to my knowledge. And it, it gives a, a good cross-section of where countries are across the continent. Um, be it dealing with sort of political issues uh, in, in Kenya, or, or be it you know just trying to get legislation passed in the first place in, in Uganda. So I think it, it gives a nice kind of cross section of what you <laughs> see in other places in the continent. So there's a, probably a lot of lessons that are that can be transferred uh, from from this to, to other countries. Uh, just a, a couple other salient points on the on the report. Um, I think the. The, the issue of, of exports is an important one. Um, I, I, I definitely would recommend the, the paper that CSIS commissioned on the, what are the actual potential impacts on, on export markets of some of these technologies. And, and you'll see that it's, it's actually preposterously overblown that this is used as a messaging point. One, in that the, the technologies that are under development, and two, in this, this misperception that somehow Europe doesn't take biotech imports when they're 
wholly dependent on, on biotech imports, including pretty much every soybean going into Europe. So it's, it's this you know, amazing, mis well, um, one among many misperceptions around this technology, but, but one that I think you know, is worth a, worth a look again and to understand. Um, I think maybe I will just kind of skip to the next part and just maybe a couple, three key thoughts for the end as I was uh, kind of thinking about what to say here. Um, the first thing is that the science is, is changing so rapidly um, that what we're considering now a, a, a genetically engineered crop um, is, is changing pretty fast, you know, from something like RNA interference, from something like zinc fingers, moving to some approaches that, that companies are taking now to do rapid mutagenesis and screen it real quickly. So basically what that means is the line between genetically engineered and non-genetically engineered is already fuzzy, and it's getting more and more fuzzy by the year, to the point that if we, if we consider the way the technology is changing, we need to be careful not to tie ourselves up in knots in the way we regulate it. Um, so it's just something to, to keep in the back of your mind as we're thinking about some of these technologies that in Kenya, you, Kenya and Uganda, where they, they might actually be 15-year-old technologies, for example. Um, it's certainly not going to become any less political of a debate um, if, if the situation in the U.S. is, is any indicator. So I think, as was, was said elsewhere, it's, it's really up to the research institutions, um, people like my, my friend here, Tush, and his colleagues and colleagues in, in other institutes to, 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 to get out there and sort of talk about what they do, to, to bring it to, to more of a, a, a tangible product and more um, sound information. And, and last is to, to continue to have uh, neutral parties like CSIS to engage in things like this and bringing, bringing fact, bringing recommendation, bringing insight um, to a lot of policymakers. But then at that point, realizing that it's going to be you know, a decision of that host country government. There's only, um, all we can do is bring facts to the situation, bring, uh, bring insight, bring, bring research, but then it, it really is a sovereign decision. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my personal opinion would be, you know, I think all farmers should have the, the same choice that, that farmers here in the U.S. have, but uh, not my decision to make. So, thank you guys. Thank you, John. Um, and John is a, a scientist himself, a biochemist, who is one of a line of AAAS fellows who has been working on this issue at USAID, so um, not a scientist with any problem communicating, so it's great to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Um, Dr. Tush, we would love to hear from you about your research and your work. Um, we had an opportunity to visit one of your research stations while we were in Uganda and look at all of the bananas. Just a fields and fields of bananas that you're working on. So I think um, we'd love to hear your presentation and have a chance to ask you some questions. Okay, thank you. And you're welcome to stand or to sit. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity and thank you for inviting me here. I I intend to take you through uh, a case study of banana as an example of uh, how we are going through the process. The, am I the Keep mic? talking. I'm going to just move your mic a little bit. Okay. In, uh, in Uganda, when uh, a decision was made to start applying biotechnology, a banana was picked as a, a startup crop because it was one of the crops that was most needed in terms of the technology uh, that we are going to apply. So I will concentrate on telling you this story to show you where we came from <coughs> and uh, where we are now. And uh, I give you uh, a projection for adoption because we've uh, done some studies to gauge uh, what sort of reception we will have when we have a product. Uh, as a background, uh, this first slide, was I wanted to show you the location of Uganda in Africa, and it's uh, that landlocked country. Uh, it's a very small country with a big population of about 32 million and uh, with uh, one of the fastest population growth rates 
three percent is a very high uh, growth rate, and uh, agriculture contributes up to twenty percent uh, uh, of our GDP, and. Uh, uh, the priority crops that we grow are those ones listed. Uh, they are not listed in the order of importance, but those are the key uh, priority food security crops. And I will pick up the, uh, the banana to talk more about it. But that map is intended to show you the distribution of the crop across the country. Uh, you will notice that it's mostly grown in the uh, uh, southern parts of the country uh, around the lakes and it's less grown in the northern areas but the situation is rapidly, rapidly changing because the advantages people see with the banana further south the people further north have also seen and yet the crop can grow literally everywhere across the country and uh, there is a demand for it. Uh, the uh, banana is a very important food security crop and uh, I give the points I will not go through all of them but I will pick uh, some which are very critical to food security like uh, all year round provision of food and family income for a commodity to have value as a food security crop it needs to store very well, like cereals, or it needs to remain in the field for a long time and providing the piece meals uh, uh, as uh, to when it is required. And banana is one of those crops which, uh, in, uh, in, uh, once you have, say, a neck of bananas, every day you will have a mature banana and they will not mature at the same time. So at any one time you have food and you have money in your pockets because you can save something uh, you, or you can eat. So that makes banana a very important food security crop. In fact, <coughs> many farmers in Uganda will tell you that uh, banana is their insurance. And once uh, that crop goes, that insurance is gone. Uh, here I intended to show you the the different the bananas appear to be many different types but they are pulled into just few and uh, the one at the extreme end uh, the east african cooking banana is the one we grow in uganda that's the one we eat that's the one which is uh, uh, taken the way uh, wheat is taken in uh, other countries and it constitutes about 80 percent of our production. But uh, this very important crop, uh, which farmers call their insurance, has, is threatened now. The productivity has been rapidly going down, and uh, the plantation life also, the good plantations in Uganda uh, last very many years. In fact, you come across some plantation which has the old as 50 years. But of late, that life has been shortening and we have plantations which disappear within four years. And that has scared farmers. So what farmers want are plantations which last long and uh, uh, plantations which uh, give them high productivity. And we analyzed it and found out that uh, what I've listed there are the factors reducing productivity and plantation life, pests and diseases, then uh, soil fertility decline. But a banana also has other weaknesses like uh, nutrients, it's low in the nutrients, and uh, uh, it has post harvest and marketing challenges different from what you get when dealing with cereal. Uh, the, uh, this slide was intended to show you the different tests the pests we have are the weevils. I think uh, many of you probably will be familiar with the weevils in other crops. Uh, what they do, they eat the stem of the plant. They are the ones which shorten the plantation life 
within a short time they accumulate and they uh, make the plants, they, they kill off the plants. Then the nematodes, they have the effect of eating roots, then the plant will fall over. And uh, the diseases, the most important one in recent times is banana bacterial wilt. It makes the plant wilt, but also it spoils the fruit, even when the fruit is there, it rots and it cannot be used. And uh, the disease can uh, uh, clear 100% of the plantation within one year. So it's uh, very, very destructive. Controllable, but uh, in smallholder farmers, it's very, very difficult to control. And uh, the, the other diseases are black zigotoka. Shizerium is not a disease of uh, uh, our type of banana, but we have sweet bananas. 20% of our bananas are the sweet types, which are affected by Fusarium. So our most serious disease, for the time being, at the highest priority disease is the bacterial wilt, which is quickly destroying highland bananas. We uh, diagnosed these problems, and between 90 and 94, we did studies to quantify how much these pests and diseases were damaging, and we found that we, they were causing 40 to, in, in East African Highland bananas, that was before bacterial wilt. Before bacterial wilt, the other pests and diseases were causing between 40 and 60 percent of uh, the yield. Uh, then, immediately, we made a decision that we needed resistant varieties to address this problem. So in partnership with uh, the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, we developed a breeding program in uh, Uganda, which uh, we started in 1994. And uh, since then, uh, between 1994 and uh, uh, up to now, the program still runs, but uh, uh, we run into challenges when uh, uh, you decide to breed bananas. They are not as easy as other crops that we have in Uganda. Uh, this uh, picture is intended to show you the, what we do in banana breeding. Uh, the, sources, the sources of resistance are in a wild banana on, uh, on the right called Calcutta. And uh, the, uh, what complicates breeding, that wild banana is not edible, it's bitter, and uh, it's not good. Yet it's the one which has the resistances that we need. In fact, it has all the resistances that we need for pests, for diseases, for name it, it's almost all there except for bacterial wilt. So when you cross, uh, you drag along some uh, undesirable things together with the, uh, the traits that you are interested in. I, in the next step, we I'm showing you uh, what you do. When you do a cross, you get uh, tetraploids and some improved uh, diploids. Then in the next step, when you cross that improved diploid and the tetraploid, you get the, re the hybrid that we release to farmers. Uh, you, you don't have to take in that. What I wanted you to capture is that the breeding, the breeding bananas is possible. The only difficulty is that you get, uh, you get a good hybrid, but which is not uh, acceptable to consumers. And that's one of the challenges that we've had with the conventional breeding of bananas. And uh, in the next slide, yeah, I go into, uh, I highlight the, uh, the real challenges of conventional breeding bananas. The one I've already mentioned, hybrids will be uh, marginally acceptable to consumers. So you get good hybrids, resistant, but uh, not, you can't, uh, sell, you, you can't get a banana which you sell on the market. 
uh, the next challenge, not all bananas can be improved. Uh, the Highland bananas are in uh, many different variants we call cultivars, and there are as many as uh, 50 different types. But of the, of the 50, only a few can be bred because all the others are sterile. Uh, that complicates breeding because the most acceptable varieties, uh, cultivars, are those which are sterile, uh, so which cannot be bred. So with breeding, you only improve a few, uh, but the most popular varieties will not be improved. And uh, that's another complication. The third complication, the, uh, some traits like, uh, as mentioned, banana bacterial wilt being the most difficult problem we are dealing with. But when you go into the banana family, all, ban all bananas, both wild and even relatives of bananas, are susceptible to this disease. So you cannot pick resistance that you use in breeding. Uh, that leaves us completely uh, defeated if we are to deal with the bacterial yield problem. In fact, when we wanted to convince our government that we needed to do uh, some biotechnology to, uh, to improve some of our crops, this is the example we gave them. That here we are, we are stuck. We've, you've supported us to do breeding for all these years, but uh, we have these challenges, and the only solution we could go for is to try genetic engineering. Then government listened and said, we support you to explore that option. And uh, we started exploring that option uh, from two, around 2000. Uh, by 2004, we had uh, started getting development partners coming in to give a hand. And uh, our first objective was to build capacity, because we didn't have capacity, we didn't know uh, what to do. We are all uh, uh, conventional, we, we knew how to carry out conventional breeding, but not how to carry out molecular breeding. And, uh, uh, with the infrastructure in, uh, in place and the human resources trained, our next objective was to use that capacity to begin to develop <coughs> uh, transgenics uh, for problems which were completely recastrant to conventional breeding. And uh, uh, mm. we would do this for all crops, starting with bananas. So what I will do, I will quickly take you through uh, some uh, highlights of where we are with the molecular breeding or development of transgenics. Uh, what I've listed are the steps we we'll go through uh, to in the development of uh, uh, transgenics. And uh, in our case in Uganda, we do two steps because bananas are difficult to breed but they are also very difficult to transform. But we've identified a variety that is very easy to transform. It's a, a, a non-East uh, African Highland type. It's one of the sweet bananas which, uh, which behaves, uh, uh, which is affected by the same constraints as Highland bananas, so, but it is easy to transform. That's the one we use as our model uh, banana to test the different traits that we're working on. So we do, uh, we go through that process in, in, in the two steps. In the round one, we do proof of concept and we move from step one to step four. Uh, at step four, we confirm whether a trait uh, uh, will work. Uh, then once we know that it works, we go back, uh, uh, but putting the gene this time in a preferred East African Highland banana. And uh, uh, here is a summary of where we are. The, uh, we have very many studies going on in what I've called proof of concept, that proof of concept phase, the first round. 
but there are two uh, uh, traits where we've completed proof of concept and we are in product development phase. And that is uh, the tackling the bacterial wilt resistance and we are using a gene which was pulled from sweet paper, uh, sweet paper and uh, <coughs> it's a project we are working on uh, together with uh, the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture and uh, supported by Uganda government and USAID. But we, the other one where we have seen proof of concept, we are trying to, I told you that bananas uh, are very poor in nutrients and uh, micronutrient nutrition is a big problem in Uganda. It's a unidentified health problem. In fact, uh, micronutrient malnutrition is con considered the third most important prob health problem in Uganda after HIV and malaria. So we are, uh, we are trying to develop an intervention uh, of uh, putting those micronutrients, the key ones are vitamin A and iron, and uh, we, we are trying to put them in banana fruits. And so far we are being successful with vitamin A. With iron we are still very far. Uh, the, this slide is intended to, to show you the highlight of what we got from proof of concept of, for bacterial wilt resistance. And uh, we, uh, you will see a, a plant which has clearly wilted. That's uh, one of the control plants. And the other ones which have remained standing, the, this field, uh, uh, we've now harvested it, but uh, it remained uh, for three years. And all plants which were susceptible wilted and they fell down. Those which remained standing are resistant. We, we inoculated with the disease again and they remained standing. So we, we are now sure that those plants are resistant. But this is in the model banana. So what we are doing now, we are moving the gene into the East African Highland bananas, which are the ones preferred by our consumers. And uh, we've also completed proof of concept for biofortification with vitamin A. And uh, uh, that's a, uh, we have, uh, with vitamin A, we selected two lines which accumulated uh, six times as much as the, the vitamin A there is in bananas. In uh, our scheme of work, our target is uh, uh, five-fold. We have to increase to vitamin A in fruits, in banana fruits, five-fold to be able to create impact on uh, uh, with the consumers. And uh, we already see that we can reach six times. So uh, now that confirms that the, uh, the concept works and we are now trying to move the gene into East African high bananas. This, uh, uh, this slide is intended to show you uh, the control and the, the, the lower one which is uh, brownish Wait, is that color brown? <laughs> not good at uh, yeah. telling colors uh, the upper one which is white is uh, the control which, uh, which doesn't have uh, the provitamin A enhanced the lower one you see the color has changed and uh, we have the vitamin A level that we need to put in these bananas. And now we are ready to go into East African Harris bananas. And uh, uh, quickly, the, uh, these are our projections because we've proven the concept. We know we can do it. And uh, in product development, we are targeting uh, developing transgenic lines with uh, enhanced vitamin A and the others with enhanced uh, bacterial wilt resistance and uh, to release them uh, uh, what did I say? Uh, 
we will complete the generation, we will complete the development of the plants by 2014. And uh, we, we will then take them into confined field trial, and we hope to complete the confined field trial, trial by 2017. And uh, uh, the next step will be, if we hope by then, the biosafety law will be in place, and uh, we hope to complete the marital location and the biosafety uh, regulatory evaluations by 2020, and uh, to release the varieties, we release two separate varieties, one with vitamin A and another one with bacterial root resistance in 2021. That's our target. Uh, the, 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 there are other uh, the activities involving development of transgenics. Uh, we, uh, we have cassava with the resistance to brown streak, then maize with the drought tolerance, and uh, uh, nitrogen, uh, the nitrogen efficient rice and uh, sweet potato with resistance to weevils and, uh, uh, and potato virus. All those are under development, but the only difference is that whereas for the banana we've developed them in Uganda, these ones have been developed by, by uh, uh, the labs we've partnered with in the north, some in America, others in Europe, and uh, they've been transferred to Uganda for evaluation. The uh, we always ask the question that uh, why are you going for the GMOs? And uh, here I tried to answer that question, at least for banana, why you went for it. Uh, you will notice that uh, the, the production constraints that we are addressing, let's give an example of bacteria will. Bacterial wilt will wipe, will cause 100% loss, and uh, there is no source of resistance in uh, the cultivated varieties, so we can't do breeding uh, for this variety. The uh, minus, in, in the absence of conventional breeding, we can try uh, cultural practices of sanitation. Farmers have been trying them, but they've failed. In fact, uh, the uh, banana production in Uganda is uh, quickly going down. And as it goes down, even the prices of bananas go up. Like now, the, the prices have more than, have multiplied in the last, in our last two years, they've multiplied uh, by three, and they are not going down. And uh, we can't sit and wait. We have. Uh, we have to do something, and uh, uh, what we've decided to do is to use the GM approach and uh, see whether we can get farmers a variety that is uh, resistant to the problem. And uh, when you look at all the other problems we are dealing with, uh, uh, they all fall in this category. They cannot be uh, improved. These crops cannot be improved for those traits using conventional means. And uh, there's no, uh, why we don't see a reason why uh, we shouldn't use that <coughs> approach to get to our farmers uh, something that solves their problem. But after that, you leave the crop to grow. Uh, some uh, uh, adoption forecast uh, in the case of uh, banana bacteria wilt, we commissioned a study by a PhD student. The student was registered at the University of uh, Bagningen. And uh, 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 the task of this student was to assess the likely acceptability of these bananas when we finally release them. And uh, here is what he found. Uh, the 58% of Ugandans expressed willingness to accept the GM banana when they 58%. And the reason they gave was 
that uh, it would, uh, they were seeing benefits, uh, particularly for bacterial wilt, it would solve their, uh, their production problem and food security problem. The, the group that uh, uh, expressed willingness, they have uh, similar attributes, more or less. Most of these people were rural farmers who are also consumers. And uh, they, they mostly have big families and they have difficulties in feeding their families. In fact, we know from studies that many of them uh, take one meal a day instead of uh, two or three meals like others. So they already have a big challenge of feeding their families. And uh, this, uh, uh, this, this group of rural farmers have confidence that the GM banana will be safe if government will clear it and say it's safe. They believe it will be safe. Uh, and uh, they live in rural areas and they be safe. But there was another group which uh, makes up 42% of uh, the Ugandan population according to this study. And uh, this group said they, they were doubtful whether we needed the GM banana. And uh, the reason they mostly gave, uh, for them it was not how it would benefit uh, the rural people. Uh, they said it, would, uh, it, it, was not, it, it was not likely to be safe. So for them, their biggest consideration was safety. And this group, the characteristics of this group, they are mostly uh, urban people who are wealth and food secure. Mm. Uh, uh, the, the, the group also includes the educated, both in rural and the urban areas, people who are educated, the ones, the ones who would consider elites in the, those areas. And uh, they have access to sufficient food. Uh, unlike the area group, these ones, food was not a problem. And uh, when the, uh, they were told about the likely benefits that we are going to accrue when a, a resistant banana gets to producers, uh, that was not convincing enough to them because after all, uh, they don't, uh, uh, they buy what they eat and there is enough to buy and they have the money to buy it. And uh, yeah, as already said, most of these live in urban centers. Uh, and uh, we see some implications uh, for communication uh, for those who are going to assist us in uh, communicating this. Uh, clearly, messages need to target uh, these uh, educated and wealthy groups who mostly live in the urban areas. The 42% are the ones we need to target. And uh, the messages need to focus on assuring this group that GMOs are safe. Uh, the other concern they have is that uh, uh, the GMs will be controlled by multinational companies who will come to exploit our poor farmers. They need to be assured that, uh, like what we are doing, what we are being supported to do with bananas, we are putting these GMOs in the hands of the public. They are being moved from control of the private companies to uh, into control by public institutions, which will release them free. But many of our elite don't know this. We still need to explain it to them again and again. But the most key thing is assuring them about uh, uh, safety. Uh, the uh, my statement here uh, will contradict what uh, uh, someone said earlier, uh, uh, but it, uh, let it remain here for, for discussion purposes. I have a feeling that uh, the uh, Europeans and Americans and these institutions who support us, USAID, who uh, 
should also talk. Uh, you, you need to speak out also in support of uh, particularly safety of these products and the need for public institutions to own these products and the about how acceptable these products are in, the, in Europe here. It is easier for you to convince this group of ours than ourselves. You can imagine me here going to uh, this group of uh, these skeptical, educated Ugandans and trying to convince them that, yes, we are, we've learned how to do these products and they are safe. And uh, uh, even in Europe, they are safe. And uh, the, in the Europe, they accept, in America, they accept. I will be less convincing. You are more convincing when you talk about it to these people. I keep hearing that uh, uh, the, say our American partners should do less and less of talking about these GMOs. Uh, personally, I don't agree with that because I think you will convince our skeptical group more than we are able to do and you need to speak out. Uh, the important thing is the message. Telling them about the, the benefits they are going to get, that one is, uh, uh, is pretty obvious and it's not their worry. For benefits, everybody knows when, uh, uh, when, when we solve these pest problems, the producers will benefit. It's the safety where they need assurance, and it's the safety where you help us to convince this skeptical group. Uh, there are also implications for policy, uh, particularly in Uganda. Uh, the rural poor will benefit most uh, from uh, the GM crops under development, and in Uganda we have uh, <laughs> policies and activities targeting uh, uh, the addressing the pro poor issues, but GMs usually are pushed out, they are not part of them. So it, the, the GMs need to be uh, brought on board as a pro poor activity. And uh, uh, we need to keep uh, saying this to our policymakers who determine what we do in these priorities. <coughs> also, uh, we are noting that by listening to anti-GM containers and delaying uh, the biosafety and biotechnology law in Uganda, the government has sided with the elites to deny the rural poor an option that will alleviate the severe inse food insecurity that they now face. And the, the, uh, our government needs to, uh, to know this and the, mm -hmm. we need to keep on repeating it to them. Because like this law, which we don't have, would have been passed long ago, but uh, they, already, they have different excuses not passing. Then uh, the last one, the, uh, this group which is skeptical about uh, the role GMs, uh, GMOs will play, the 46%, uh, we need a special, the, our, communication, our communication needs to target them because they are very influential in rural areas. We don't want, if we don't deal with them, they will go there and will negatively influence the, uh, the rural producers before uh, they accept these varieties. So we have a feeling that uh, uh, we need a strategy and a communication program to engage uh, this 46% who are skeptical so that we reduce that number and we get uh, people who support what we are doing so that when they go in rural areas, they talk in support rather than uh, opposing what we do because they are influential and finally the rural people will listen to them. Uh, that brings me to the end of uh, the presentation. These are the partners uh, we work with, the, the funding agencies, Uganda government, USID, the and Miranda Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. Then a list of uh, partners we work with in this area is also listed. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. That was just such a, a good, high-level but detailed overview of both what's happening and also the rationale. But it reminds me of how difficult it must be to take this very, very complicated topic and make it so clear and concise. And that's part of the challenge with communicating about science because it's very complicated and it's hard to boil it down into really understandable messages. Um, with that, I'd like to just turn um, to questions. Uh, I have a bunch myself, so if no one has one, I'll start out. But um, I think what I will do is I'd like to bundle two to three questions at a time and ask you to please speak into the microphone, give your name and affiliation um, as you speak. So we're going to start over here. Scott, we're going to take you first, and then the gentleman uh, in the blue suit will be next. I have a question. How much Scott. Is, oh, sorry. Follow orders, Scott. <laughs> Scott Agabas, yes, Thank you. Sorry. It's uh, on. Yeah. How much longer would you consider this to be a choice? I think we've sort of been talking about this in the conversation as GM adoption is a choice in these countries going forward. At 3% growth rates over the next 20 years, if you get 10 to 15 year lead time, the world in Uganda and Tanzania and Kenya is going to be very different in 20 years from now. I just wonder uh, what you were thinking about in terms of that long lead time that you're talking about in your research and how that's going to impact choice in this matter. Okay, and then the gentleman right behind. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Weiner from Beyond Systems. Uh, you mentioned, of course, the, the production of uh, bananas have declined uh, due to uh, pests and disease uh, in the recent years. I'm wondering if uh, is there a reason why uh, you can't use the techniques uh, you used to raise these crops uh, before this decline, uh, as opposed to introducing transgenic uh, uh, bananas, which, which contain insecticides, fungicides, and other toxins? Can I like to add to that, um, Dr. Tush? You gave the number of forty, sort of forty to sixty percent loss. Was that the result of uh, an event or set of pests or diseases, or was that just sort of historically how much of a crop is lost? And if you could take that set of questions right now, that would be great. Yes, if I can start with the last one, we. We did studies, we had uh, a project to analyze the losses, the, the pests and diseases we are causing. And actually it was a three year mm -hmm. uh, study on, on farm and on station uh, to quantify how much these pests and diseases were causing. And uh, they were all lying between 40 mm -hmm. and 60%. So this is just the natural state of being? Yes, okay. the natural state, yes. And uh, the, uh, a similar question as the earlier techniques of controlling these pests and diseases. Yes, they are there, but uh, they are not effective in uh, rural settings. In fact, for uh, the only effective way to deal with uh, a pest and disease in a, a rural setting is to deploy resistant varieties. There are sanitation practices, for instance, for control of uh, weevils and for control of bacterial wilt, and they are being tried. But the crop has continued uh, going despite uh, these practices being promoted because uh, f somehow farmers don't, uh, don't use them. Farmers have so many other things to do and uh, the cultural practices are so labor consuming, nobody has time to do them. Instead, what they would prefer is to change from that crop to another one which doesn't require them. And in the process, they end up changing from uh, crops which are giving them food security to ones which they are not used to handling and uh, then they, uh, uh, they fail. And uh, I, I don't know, I think I didn't get yours correctly, if you can uh, sure. elaborate. So, so if they're growing at 3%, so you, you mentioned the country you're focusing on is growing at 3.2%. I think almost all the other countries in this study are growing right about 3% growth. Yes, yes. So if you talk about a 10 to 15 year lead time, 
15 mm. years from now, that country is going to be uh, very different. You'll have so many more people that test a pee. Yes. I'm just wondering how much longer is it going to be a choice to adopt or not adopt gene, especially if you're talking about the yield loss that you were describing. Yeah, the, the, that's the, that makes uh, the technology even more important because uh, we need to control these losses. It's like uh, now we can afford to to lose uh, even 60% and we don't starve. But time will come when we will need to, uh, to save all the potential that our crops give to be able to feed the population, and that won't be long. So for us, I think this technology is very, very critical mm. uh, because it will fix the problem that uh, we are heading to in the future. Mm. Great, okay, um, let me see. Okay, woman right here, and then the uh, man in the blue shirt in the back. We'll take those two questions yeah. next. Oh, here. I'm, uh, okay, Connie we can hear. Freeman, Syracuse University. Yes. Once again, welcome, Dr. <laughs> thank you, thank you. you. I'm fascinated by your um, explication about communication that rural poor people are more likely, and farmers more likely to be receptive to GMs than the urban elites. But then further, that you think that foreigners, Westerners, are the ones to do the education of those elites. And I would have thought that the Westerners would be associated with the private companies trying to push their technology, and that it would be most important for Ugandans, uh, like yourself, to be propagating this with the elites. So can you talk a little more about why you think Westerners will be heard by your elites more than your own elites? Good question. And the man in the blue shirt. Yeah, Gavin Graham, of the International Public Institute. What do you see the role of civil society organizations um, in Uganda, in East Africa, in this conversation between the farmers and the government researchers um, and uh, organizations that come here? Uh, sorry, I. So I'm. Role of civil society organizations. Oh, civil society. Why don't we take those questions now? Yes, uh, the, the first one, the, uh, every time I'm talking to these elites of ours, I see the questions they keep asking. Number one, their concern is safety. And they recognize that it's recently when uh, we started learning how to apply the technology, and the technology comes from, uh, from the north. And uh, the, I can see uh, we don't effectively convince them about uh, safety. Uh, something still remains. You will explain, and they say, mm -mm, we can't be convinced, because even you, without, uh, if you fully know, because you are applying the technology. But we, I, I have a feeling uh, they shouldn't, people from, uh, you, you shouldn't lead the communication, but you should participate in the communication to help us assure the, uh, our elites that the product is safe. Mm -hmm. Their concern is that biotechnology is safe, and they are not convinced that uh, we, we can analyze effectively its safety. After all, they know that when we come to uh, biosafety evaluations, we contract uh, people outside to do it. We don't do them ourselves. We subcontract people, uh, laboratories in the in USA, to do our evaluations. Uh, so if you participated in a, uh, talking about their safety, I think it would be helpful. But you've kept quiet. We, we, we are there trying to explain and uh, getting these questions and uh, trying to answer them. And they are waiting to hear from the science here, and everybody's quiet. Uh, you, you've just informed this entire group who I think almost all feels that, we, that the U.S. should take a quiet 
supportive role rather than a vocal one. So this is this is a yes. new piece of information that I think everyone's going to yes. kind of think about. It's yes. um, very different approach. Yeah, in, in, in particular, talking about the safety, the safety you you talk about it better than uh, us. Mm. You have more authority on mm. safety of products than ourselves. And uh, these are educated people who want to hear it from uh, uh, authorities. Mm. You are more authoritative in that area. Uh, it's something we, food for, food for thought. Very interesting. <laughs> yes. Uh, then you, you said the law of civil society. Uh, Yes, right. Uh, that one has been a, a, a mixed bag. Uh, there are some civil societies who, who are really supportive. The, the, the local NGOs which have not been influenced, uh, which support what we are doing. And uh, in fact, they are part of uh, our, uh, our communication program, they help us to go out and uh, uh, and uh, do the communication. But then there are some which are linked particularly to NGOs from Europe, and uh, they are very well funded, and uh, uh, they are doing a lot of uh, the campaigning of what we are doing. And uh, we, we need to counter their negative propaganda. And we are not doing much. I think the uh, they they out, they outdo us in a really, uh, by a huge percentage. We need to do a lot to catch up with them. Let me just um, I'm going to just put a point of information, then I'll take these three questions. Um, this the the survey data you have is really interesting and i should mention uh, at the beginning i mentioned that we're part of a 14 project set of activity and a number of those projects are, are collecting survey data they're talking with farmers in uganda and kenya and tanzania and other places to ask them about not just sort of what's your attitude what do you think about this stuff but also how what's important to you in cooking what's what traits are important as you're cooking and eating your bananas um so over the next six to eight months, we should have a set of uh, 13 more studies and reports that are going to shed more light um, and I think more data onto this uh, set of discussions. So I think those will be very interesting. And I think, Patrick, those will be on the B4FA website, right? And that's Biosciences for Farming in Africa, B4FA. So these will be, I think, very, very helpful mm -hmm. compliments. Yes, okay, you. gentlemen right there, and then Mitzi, and then a woman right behind you. I'm, um, I'm Could so you stand up so we can hear you? Um, I was out of reception in the night, and we had been talking about this very subject with a keen diplomat who uh, expressed a resentment that there were, that this technology was being force fed by U.S. and Western monopolistic mon companies that came to pass. And he suggested that <coughs> We somehow have to revisit in order to convince Africa and the rest of the world about the good components of this technology that we somehow have to revisit and possibly rescind the patent rights that enable a few companies to be <coughs> and, and, and create wider disbursement among a multiplicity of companies. He also suggested much greater transparency, long term studies by credible scientists, and also perhaps a return. Yeah, and I think well, this is a very good question in terms of um, property ownership or the intellectual property, which you can address. Uh, Mitzi? Mitzi Wertheim? No, no microphone. Mike's, no, just stand up and say who you are and your question. I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Post Graduate School. My first suggestion is for you, and then I'm going to go on to him. I'm struck by the complexity. 
complexity of this issue. We live in an incredibly complex world today. We don't educate anybody to think in those terms. We all have special needs. And in order to deal with the problems we have today, it requires an interdisciplinary approach. There's just no question about that to me. And you could do a great deal for us if you would start doing studies on what we need to learn in universities rather than having them know what my necklace looks like, not that I'm wearing it or any of the other. For you, I just want to suggest, I've been interested in energy for a long time. And all of a sudden, we got fracking. And all the engineers want to get in and do it and say it's terrific. And New York City, New York City says, hey, wait a minute. You may ruin our water. So it gets back to the safety issue and holding the engineers back before they try to push it on all of us and sort of destroy our livelihood. I mean, I think that's a genuine concern. I was in Germany for the I, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop you there, but your, your point is basically, you got, you got scientists or engineers moving forward. How do you make sure that the public discussion follows along? And I'm, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, uh, close your question there and ask the woman behind you to go ahead with your question. What I can talk about the GMO is uh, like politics in Africa. Politics and what we are talking about is the same. So what we need to do is we local organizations, first here I focus on agriculture in the rural areas. In fact, I'm working on soya beans in the Western Kenya, although they are not generally modified, but we were looking for the same technology, but we don't have funding for that. So what we are trying, we as local organizations, how do we participate because we are the people to give the message to the local rural, rural people what, what the, 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 the problems, the goodness of the food that we are going to grow. Because if we don't explain them, we can translate in our local languages the message, communication as uh, she has said. That communication is what the local people don't understand. We want to fight poverty. How do we fight poverty with the same crop they grow every day? So they have to learn to understand through um, capacity building, training, and you can work with us to train them, translate the literature, to tell them this is good for the people. Because at the end of the day, when there is hunger, they'll run to America. America will take them the food. Europe will take them the food. And they can still do that. We can still do that in our own countries to fight poverty. Great. How do we work with you good. all to make Great. this happen? Thank you. Okay, that's a big set of questions. I think, John, I may ask you to jump in a little bit on the communication side, too. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, a, a, a couple things. First, I would be, be curious what specifically he was, what, what technologies, and, and specifically your, your diplomat friend would, would be thinking that are being forced upon the Kenyans, of the technologies out there. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I oh. think let's, it was a general comment. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I mean, yep. yeah. I mean, because the, the, aside from cotton, in which the, the Kenyan Agricultural Research Institute is a, a whole willing partner who wants to bring that to their cotton farmers, everything is freely licensed, available to put in the public domain like everything else. So it, without getting to specifics, it's tough to answer that. Um, on the on the long term long term studies, um, I, I've been referring a lot of people to this uh, to this site. Um, it's called Genera, where they basically cataloged hundreds and hundreds um, of safety assessments of peer reviewed papers um, conducted by independent researchers, uh, university types, academics, uh, including long term studies, uh, basically replicating the the same information that was produced by maybe the Seralini study that uh, influenced your your question. Um, the last part about on, on IP redistribution, um, I, I can't fully address that. I think that might be outside the scope in this particular um, issue. Um, on the I don't know, uh, on the holding back of innovations, uh, and I'm not very much of an expert on, on, on fracking for sure, but I would at least know from the case of agricultural technologies, the people who have been working on this for, for four decades feel pretty held back um, as far as doing assessments on the same technologies, the same genes, over and over and over and over and over and over again to the point of um, to the point of ridiculousness. So, I'll stop there. Okay, Dr. Tush. The 
the I wanted to address the the point to start with the point she was raising, uh, but I'm not sure whether I picked you well, whether I picked her well. You, you can interpret this for me. Um, Mitzi's question, I think, was how do you how do you make sure that science runs in parallel with the public dialogue? Mm -hmm. And I think in Uganda, if I can answer for a minute mm -hmm. for you, what we found, unlike the other two countries in Uganda, the public dialogue and the science, his act and the regulatory process has kind of moved along all together. The science community and the policy community and the public are kind of on board with the idea that we need new solutions for food security mm -hmm. and that this is one of them. And your survey result tracked very much with what we heard in our um, interviews and conversations, that there is a lot of trust in the public research system. There's a lot of trust in the government. And if the government has declared a particular crop safe or a particular variety or a particular new product, um, that, that farmers tend to be comfortable and confident in what the government says. And yes. that seems to track with what you have said in your slide. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Let me take yes. another round of questions. Um, go ahead, Ellen. And then I'm going to skip you because we already had you and get two people who haven't spoken. Uh, right, Andy right in the back and then light blue shirt. Just stand up and. Hi, I'm, I'm Ellen Levinson, and I, um, I do a lot of different work as a consultant in the, this field. Um, one of the questions I have is there was a lot of work going on just, you know, in the African Union to try to come up with, you know, biosafety evaluations that would take place above and beyond country by country, because one of the difficulties for countries, and Kamesa had looked at this, you know, country by country, it's hard to conduct the risk assessments and all of that. And I, I'm just wondering how helpful would that be, not only to move forward in your work, um, but also in terms of getting greater credibility about the concept of the risk assessments and the safety issues. Mm -hmm. And do you see any institutions that are African institutions, so not just necessarily country specific, that pull that together? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a fora or you mm -hmm. know whatever that, that could play that role. and. Um, you know, be a voice to bring those experts and, and the technology, you know, to the to the people in, in a better way. So both of those kinds of questions. Okay. Great. And Andy, you had a okay. question and comment? Um, Andy Benson with the uh, International Food Information Council and Foundation. Uh, there's been quite a lot of talk about multi-sectoral engagement mm -hmm. and international engagement or local engagement. And I see kind of two communication tracks emerging one going to the farm community and requiring assurances of safety and credibility from the government. And at the same time, uh, communications going out to cultural opinion leaders in the cultural elite of the country. Uh, I see the debate, uh, do we need the international input? Is that welcome or is that uh, going to push the issue backwards and set it forwards? Should issues be local? Uh, should there be international and something that came up much earlier in the dialogue, which I think is important to this, uh, is the role of media uh, in countries. Uh, the media, uh, somebody suggested earlier, uh, the possibilities of recruiting the media and encouraging and incentivizing them as a source of balanced and credible information to devise the process. Uh, so that's one channel I would suggest. And I would suggest that maybe shouldn't choose between the local approach or the international approach, which is local and international food supply that we all share a part of, and we really do need each other. And there are extension programs to farm communities, which we have undertaken many years ago in the States, which in principle are duplicable in developing countries, things that we've done eight or nine years ago, helping train the trainer uh, at the local level of the farm. So are there initiatives? that way, and do you have thoughts on how we could work in a more collaborative approach uh, rather than just doing this parallel to different things? Great. And then I'm going to, um, young man in the light blue shirt, and I'm going to make this the last question because we're running low on time. So go ahead. Right. Um, Adam J. Mattire from the Corona Corporation. And um, there's a, been a lot of discussion sort of on the opportunity of biotechnology to like springboarding Africa's. So Celeste Juman at Harvard um, believes that that could be super 
after ICP did, and I worked mm -hmm. in Rwanda for a long time, and there was a significant pushback on GMOs, and we very quickly discovered policymakers that it wasn't Rwandans or rural people who were advocating against it mostly, it was people from outside. So I think that one, uh, I want to know what your feelings are and why. Um, activists against GMOs are using Africa as sort of their place of targeting anti-GMO activities and how successful you think biotechnology can transform Africa to become the ICT, do that for Africa what ICT did for Africa. Okay, great. And we'll stop there, do final responses, and then close up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the first one on uh, African institutions, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not very, very familiar with the work which was already being done by African Union, but I know there are institutions like, uh, like FARA, uh, uh, which have programs and projects uh, on uh, biotechnology stewardship and uh, and biosafety, and they could. Uh, they need to continue doing what they are doing right now, and uh, uh, we would uh, finally get there. Uh, if there are other institutions that can come in to help, I think uh, uh, they could also come in, but uh, FARA could coordinate them. John, do you want to come? Yeah, I was going to just speak to, to that point, to, to your question, Ellen. I think um, um, certainly the, the African Union has had the longstanding effort through the model law, which is um, – been been quite restrictive and um, not not productive for those who want to utilize biotechnology. I think um, Comesa and to a, a, a smaller extent ECOWAS they have put forward the exact model that you you were describing and that you have kind of a, a, a pooled risk assessment pool where you have somewhat standardized guidelines you have standardized assessments but the um, the uh, the authority still delegates to the host country so it's not in a situation where every country in Comesa has to agree on a product approval. Rather, you can just take that information, um, pooled resources to get kind of the base, best safety assessment you can make, but then it's still the sovereign decision. And, and I think that's probably the, the best way forward, lest we have kind of gridlock like we have in Europe where you need more of a consensus thing. But it, it, Comesa is definitely the furthest ahead. To my knowledge, the African Union hasn't really gone down that path very much, other than some discussion about revising the model law. But Then the the question, the issue on uh, multi-sector engagements in a particularly communication, I th I think I would agree with the, uh, the uh, an approach where uh, the all sectors get involved in a, in a communication about uh, biotechnology. Uh, currently, when you look at uh, uh, what is happening. Uh, particularly in Uganda, we've, we've tried to, to move together, but we could probably do better. The, we don't have a kind of strategy that unites all of us. Each, each, each small group organizes uh, the way they want, and uh, they go out, and uh, we could uh, probably do it better. Uh, as uh, all sectors uh, that are stakeholders uh, being involved and well coordinated. I, I hope I picked your question very well. If I still... Mm -hmm. I think that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, then the, the, the last one on uh, why... Uh, th that's a tough one when... Uh, it, when you look at what's happening, it's like uh, the, uh, the fight against uh, the technology has now shifted to Africa. And uh, I have a feeling the reason that is, is the uh, 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 people who are anti the technology are seeing the chances of uh, the technology being taken up in Africa, the highest, because that's where the demand for it is the, is the highest. We, uh, when you look at the situation in our rural areas, we need these technologies more than probably any people you can think of 
in Europe, in America, they don't have, uh, uh, they are not uh, food insecure like us. So the, uh, the anti-GMO activists have become very, very active in Africa because uh, of what they are seeing is going to become a successful launching of these technologies. I think what we need to do probably, uh, if we can uh, quickly have some of these products on the ground and uh, uh, people start using them, uh, the technology will be uncontrollable. If it can go in the hands of uh, the end users who need it, right now we are only talking, we haven't put anything in their hands. Once the technology gets into their hands, uh, it will no longer be controllable. It is going to spread like a wildfire. Some of them are very good technologies, mm -hmm. and uh, farmers will use them whether uh, yeah, s some whether uh, those educated people with their European counterparts want or not. And this is a good question to end on, too, because I think as we set out to undertake this study and where we concluded, fell in the same place, which is that um, it's, it's pretty dangerous to look at GM technology as the answer, but uh, because there are so many investments needed in ag development and the ag sector. But there are two important pieces to look at. One is that any investment in the pathways, in the markets, in seed systems, in fertilizer, and access to finance, and in research, all of those investments and all those efforts are very important, whether it's GM technology or not. And the second is that hybrid adoption is so very low that it is vital it is vital for farmers just to have better inputs and to have training and education on how to use them effectively, because handing out new seeds, whatever kind they are, is not going to do the trick if you don't train people on how to use them. So looking at this technology as a really important tool for problems that, as you, as you very carefully noted, can't be addressed with conventional breeding or as just um, something that farmers want to use because they like it and they have access to it and they think it works well and their government has found it safe. Those are, those are issues that, um, that really need attention and that I think we've, we feel really lie with the host governments. But what you have told us today is that we can't just let them lie with the host governments, that the U.S. and Americans and the European community all have to be part of the discussion because that's an important part of um, the debate and discussion. So we should uh, be engaged uh, however carefully we might feel that we need to be, but be engaged nonetheless. Um, it has been a distinct pleasure to have you here, Dr. Tush. I'm so pleased that you could make time to stop. Um, it has been so much better to hear from you than it would have been to hear from all of us. And John, thank you. You have been so, so, such a great partner as we um, worked through the entire project and, and helped us to understand things. So thank you for being with us. And thank you all for joining us. And let's give our folks a hand.